We are, as almost all of you know, continuing our study of the Minor Prophets, the last 12 books in the Old Testament. Last week we started Habakkuk, and we covered chapter 1 of Habakkuk. This week we'll be continuing Habakkuk, covering only chapter 2 tonight. So please do have your Bible out, follow along as we go. To remind you of, of a couple of introductory points from last week, um, Habakkuk is usually understood to have two main parts. The first part <clears throat> is a dialogue between God and Habakkuk. God and Habakkuk are talking back and forth between one another. The second part is Habakkuk's prayer or song. Not clear whether he he prayed that prayer to God or sang that prayer to God or, or both. But these are the two main parts of the book that, that we're studying. And, of course, we're in the first part, which is a dialogue be between God, God and Habakkuk. We covered about half of it last time. To remind you what we've already covered, here's an outline of the dialogue between God and Habakkuk. If you remember, in the first verses 2 through 4 there, Habakkuk begins by complaining to God about all of the wickedness that he sees in the world. It's not clear whether he's complaining about wickedness within Israel, as many of the other prophets we've been studying have done, or whether he's complaining only about the wickedness of Assyria and Babylon and the nations that afflict Israel, or whether he's praying, complaining about both of those things. I think basically... If I can summarize it myself, I'd say he looks in the world around him, within Israel, outside of Israel, everywhere he looks, he sees wickedness and injustice, and he's basically asking God, God, why don't you do something about all this wickedness and injustice that I see? That's the first complaint by Habakkuk. And then God responds right away by saying, Habakkuk, I am doing something. I was thinking God could have said, I'm always doing something. If God wasn't always doing something, the universe would sort of wink out of existence because God is the one who's sustaining everything that, that we know. <clears throat> so, of course, God is doing something. But the thing that God is doing that he points to here in response to the complaint from Habakkuk is God says, I am raising up the Chaldeans. And at this point in history, Chaldeans is another word for Babylonians. God is raising up Babylon. It's, it's a surprising answer, it seems to me, because Habakkuk was, part of the evil he was looking at was the, the affliction of Israel by Assyria and Babylon, and, and God says, I am raising up the, the Babylonians. The Babylonians, history will tell us, weren't quite as bad as the Assyrians, but there were no saints, and the one thing that the Babylonians did, that the Assyrians never did do, is they came all the way in, into Jerusalem, threw down the temple in Jerusalem and took most of the country away into exile. And so it might seem like a strange reassurance to Habakkuk that God says, I am doing something. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. All right. So within Israel, outside of Israel, the prophet sees evil and injustice. And he hears God responding back and saying, well, I'm in this, the, the, a lot of this injustice that you see. I'm the one that's raising up the Chaldeans. And then in his second complaint, Habakkuk comes back, and he starts out by saying, God, I know that you're glorious. I know that you're good. Um, he said, I understand what you've told me, that the Babylonians have been raised up as a, re as a reproach. They've been ordained, he says, by God as a judgment, as a reproof, which is true. So he's understood that point. And yet, he goes on and he says, there's just so much terrible evil and injustice in the world afflicting mankind which is man is created in God's image, inflicting even Israel, God's chosen people. It's as if Nebuchadnezzar and other evil men like him string up the people like they're fish, like they're vermin, he says. And so Habakkuk's second complaint ends the way I've outlined it in the first verse of chapter 2 with Habakkuk saying, okay, I know that you're a good God and all these things, but I'm going to wait and see what you're going to say back to me in response to my second complaint. Why, God, does there have to be evil in the world? And then God responds 
which is chapter 2 in tonight's lesson. So tonight we'll be reading chapter 2 of Habakkuk, which is God's answer to the second complaint of Habakkuk. So let's, without further ado, let's go ahead and read on into that and see what we can make of God's response. So let me reread verse 1 of chapter 2, first of all. It goes like this. It says, I will, make, I will take my stand at my watch post. I will station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Sorry, let me read it better one more time. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So the voice that we hear speaking is the voice of Habakkuk. He's the one that's I. He says, I'm going to take my stand and I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch. And we discussed last week, and as would be obvious from where this appears in the Bible, Habakkuk is, is a prophet in Israel. More specifically, probably he's a prophet in Judah around about the time that the Assyrians will decline and the Babylonians will rise. And so part of what's going on here is a prophet in Israel doing his job. He has some job to interpose himself between the people and between God. But I think here, that's not the only thing that's going on. Here, we're hearing the voice of one of these faithful, waiting, watching people. He's not the only one. He, his voice is the voice of any faithful person who's faithfully waiting and watching for God to explain himself. God's people look around the world. They know God is good. They know God is powerful. They can see the evil in the world and they say, why? Why, why is there this evil in the world? He is asking. Okay. And it's not a casual question here. You, you, we, can, we can see that. All right. He says he's established a watch post. He takes his stand there at that watch post. This is the most important thing that he's doing. He has a place and a job. His place is a watch post, and his job is to watch and wait and see what God will do. He goes on and he says that the watch post is on a tower, and I have up on the slide a picture of, of, a, of a tower. Right? And a tower is kind of a safe and isolated place up away from the world where this faithful person can be with God and talk to God and look out and see what God will do and look out and try to hear what God will say in response to this complaint which he's raised up about all the evil that he sees in the world. Okay. And again remember what is his complaint from chapter 1 is the existence of evil and injustice in the world insofar as God is powerful and perfectly good. How can he reconcile these things? Okay. And I said before, and I'll say in passing, if you're really paying attention, child of God, if you're paying attention to your Bible, you have to, you have to ask yourself this question, and you have to have a tower where you can go up and watch and wait and try to understand what God says in reply. Because much of what happens in the Bible is, is God's people asking this question and, and struggling to understand God's answer. Right. So that's just a review. We read that last week, but we'll start again this week with verse 1 of chapter 2, which is Habakkuk saying to God, I'm going to wait and see what you're going to say. Right. So in, in verse 2 of chapter 2, <coughs> the Lord answers him. So now God is speaking. Right? Chapter 2, verse 2 says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. I will reread this one also. This is not necessarily an easy one to understand. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. All right, so he's asked God a question. He's made a complaint to God. God responds promptly, it seems, in this vision that we're, that we're, that's been recorded for us by Habakkuk. But the answer is not a resolution of the problem that Habakkuk has pointed to. God hasn't said, okay, I'll put all evil away now. The answer is rather an instruction from God to Habakkuk the prophet 
And now he is functioning in, in his prophetic capacity because God's instruction to him is, he says, to write the vision. Write it down. Now let's set aside for a moment the question of specifically what is the vision he's writing down. That may come clear automatically later on, but let's just set that aside. God tells Habakkuk to write it on tablets, plainly. Some of the translations say write it in large letters. The, the, the sense of the grammar is write it down so people can read it really easily, big enough and clearly enough so that people can read it. The grammar here almost certainly does not mean does not mean that people will read this and suddenly start running. That's not what it means. Rather, the grammar, everyone seems to agree, everyone who can read Hebrew better than we can, that the meaning is that the sign should be so easy to read that nobody has to stop to read it. Running is a curious word. I have a picture of runners up here, guys out jogging. They're not starting to run. They've been running for a while. They're running down the street, and there's a sign beside the road. And this is the image that you want to understand this first. God has said to Habakkuk, write the vision, write it large on tablets, write it big so people can see it without stopping to have to, have to, to look at it. Right. So then Habakkuk gets a quick answer to his complaint. God isn't ignoring him. But the answer points Habakkuk not to the resolution of his problem, but to a sign which in turn is pointing the faithful people who see the sign off into the future and saying, don't stop yet. The answer is in the future. You're running towards something that's still coming. You shouldn't stop yet is almost certainly the main message that Habakkuk wants to get across here. And if, if I could just remind you how many times this is the message in the Bible. I, I think I've said this before. We studied Revelation in the first three chapters. Jesus among the churches in John's vision says, persevere. Persevere, persevere, persevere. Paul, I think it's in Philippians chapter 3 or someplace, Paul says, forgetting what's behind and looking forward, I press on to the goal, right? So this is a kind of a message to, to, to Jews and Christians, Old Testament and New, if you're in a relationship, a faithful relationship with God. Don't stop, keep going, because the resolution of the problem that you're seeking happens at an appointed time and it's not yet. It's not yet. Wait for it. Keep moving towards it. All right. It's not time to stop and look where you are now for the answer. All right. So then <clears throat> verse 3 is God still speaking. He says, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. All right. God said it better than I did. <laughs> All right. and, and so whatever the end specifically in view is, and that's, that's not totally clear yet, there is a time appointed when it's going to be realized. There's an appointed time in the future. All right. And if, if we continue with the previous picture I had up here of the guys jogging down the highway, then we might say, well, you haven't reached the finish line yet, right? The, the, there's a sign coming up here which is going to say finish line, but it won't be finished till you cross the finish line. And right now you're, oh, you're, I have runners in the back here, so you're not to the finish line yet, and so the appointed time to stop running your marathon is when you cross the finish line, not, not now, all right? Um, that's one example I could think of. Like, again, like Paul's, Paul's always talking about running the race and so on. I think a better example here about the appointed time might be something that we look around us in nature and see could only be achieved in a certain period of time. For example, I put up a picture of a tea kettle. You know, water, we have a saying in English, a watched pot never boils. You can watch it and watch it and it'll never boil. And the minute you, you stop looking, the tea kettle, it'll, it'll boil. It's kind of a, just a joke. But the, the point is, you can't force the tea kettle to boil any sooner or later than the laws of physics will allow. There's a time when the kettle will boil. You put heat under it, you wait a certain amount of time, other conditions taken into account, it'll boil when it's ready to boil, not before, okay? And not after either. Or think about women having a healthy baby. You, you may want your baby to come in three months or four months, but that wouldn't be safe, right? To have a healthy baby, you, you, you want to wait until nine months and then, and then have 
a healthy baby then, and, and the baby is going to come when it comes. It's not going to come before it comes or after it comes. It's going to come when it comes. And like everything else that has an appointed time, it's God who appointed the time of the coming of a child. There are, there are a lot of other examples. Um, the one in the background isn't maybe good for a Baptist church, but I have kegs of wine. Wine isn't finished. <laughs> Wine isn't finished until wine is finished. You know, you can put grape juice in, into the process and you can say, I wish I could sell my wine tomorrow, but if, if, if you want to make good wine and sell it at a high price, you're going to have to wait until the recipe says it's time to, to, to taste and to sell, to sell that wine. Or, I just let me keep out this baking a cake or waiting for the sun to rise. You may say, it's 4 a.m., I really wish the sun would rise. And all the wishing in the world will not force the sun up over the horizon until it's time for the sun to rise. The, the sun rises at the appointed time. The, right, summer follows spring at the appointed time, and fall follows summer, and winter follows fall. There's all kinds of things in the world we live in which can only happen at the appointed time. Right? Right, and they can't come early, and they can't come late. And that's the point, I think, that, that God is making here. To Habakkuk. If it seems like they're late to you, Habakkuk, just wait a little longer. It's not that they're not going to happen. I've decreed that they will happen. It, they will certainly happen. In fact, the way God reckons time, they've already happened. When God promises something, it's already happened. It just hasn't caught up to our time yet, right? All right, so not one second earlier, not one second later, will you move these things from their appointed time. Seems to be the point of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse, verse 3. What you're waiting for, Habakkuk, hasn't happened yet. Just wait a little bit longer. Okay. So now let me return to the question. What exactly is the content of this vision? What's the thing that they're waiting for? The, the, the vision that Habakkuk is supposed to, to write in a big sign that people can read so that they keep looking and running and don't try to stop now. And some people early in the church who read the Bible very allegorically, jumped right to thinking that Habakkuk was talking about the coming of Christ. Or the last day, the day of the Lord, when the kingdom of heaven would come on earth and, and all evil would be put away and, 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 and you know, Christ would reign. I think it's much more likely that Habakkuk, as he wrote, was looking for relief from the oppression of his Babylonian and or a Syrian oppressor. But all of these events, the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, and the overthrow of the Babylonian oppressors, all of these have an appointed time. God has appointed all of these times. And between the time appointed for the overthrow of the Babylonians and the time appointed for the final coming of Christ and the kingdom come on earth, there's a whole series of appointed times that, 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 that God has. Supremely, between Habakkuk's time and the end of time is the incarnation of God's Son Jesus, His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension. That's coming. It's a, that's appointed. It won't come any sooner or later than God has, has appointed it, right? And I do not think that Habakkuk has a clear sense of all of these appointed times. I think it's pushing the text too far to say that, that a prophet doing prophecy seven centuries before the birth of Christ is specifically talking about that. Right. But what he is talking about is very closely related. And what's being talked about here is he's talking about how do faithful people, how do faithful children of God respond to God? They respond to God by turning to him and trusting him to take care of everything, regardless of, of, of what they see. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, there's a place where Peter says that Habakkuk and the other prophets of God had in them the spirit of Christ, and they inquired carefully concerning these things, these subsequent glories that they could somehow see in their prophetic vision to try to see what the content was. And Jesus was in there. However, clearly they saw him seven centuries ahead of time. All right. But I, I would say that it, it would be better first to understand how Habakkuk understood what he was saying, and then later we can look at why New Testament authors quoted these same verses in the light of Jesus Christ. So Habakkuk's probably just looking for relief from the evil that, that he sees. And I have up here on my slide in the background is kind of a glorious kingdom of God coming kind of a picture. 
And I think that that's there, for sure, it's there. The Bible says all of the promises are yea and amen in Christ. That's true, for sure. Jesus is in back of everything. In fact, Jesus is in back of the creation of the universe. It was created by him and for him. But what Habakkuk is talking about is the fall of Babylon, probably, right? when, when he can get out from under a lot of the wicked oppression that he sees in the world around him. Okay. You don't have to agree with that. I, I suppose there are people who look at it the other way. But. So now, Habakkuk is going to go on and talk about people who are not faithful. Habakkuk's among the righteous few who live by God, by faith in God and in faithfulness to God. His voice speaks on behalf of all of us who can be described that way, and hopefully some of us, us can. He's up in his tower in his watch post. He's praising God. He's questioning God. He's waiting for God to answer. He hears God telling him, an answer's coming, but you need to wait for the resolution. Please tell other people to wait also. All right. The opposite of these faithful people shows up here in verse 4. And they're described here. Let me, let me read verse, verse 4. It says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. All right, so um, the, the one whose soul is puffed up, that is not upright within him, is being held in contradistinction to the faithful one who's waiting on, on, on the, voice of, the voice of God. These are the ones like Nebuchadnezzar, like the evil leadership in Israel that other prophets have been speaking against like other people before and after them who are not godly and who, who don't live by faith in God and who are not faithful to God. Okay. These are the people that Habakkuk's going to talk about now for a while because it's to them that justice is finally coming when, when, the, when the appointed time arrives. And I put up here um, a picture of Gordon Gecko, the fictional character from the movie Wall Street. If you ever saw this movie, it's a really good example, I think, of sort of modern-day Nebuchadnezzar because, because we're talking about someone who doesn't, who isn't faithful, who tries by his own designs and by his own pride and by his own efforts to gobble up the world, to, to, to own everything, to buy everything, to control everything, to have everything. And because he thinks he's right and better than everyone else, he can't possibly listen to God. And he will destroy many people. And modern day people, in this movie it was the trade unions or somebody are going to say, how long, oh Lord, do we have to suffer, you know, Gordon Gekko, and finally God, God will say, wait a little bit. Because none of these guys get away with anything, is, is basically what God is, is always, always saying, just wait a little bit. Right? So. And I, I need to say before I get off of this, this point, because we'll be touching on this theme again and again, it's easy to point to someone, even a fictional character, and say, well, this is an evil you know, uh, counterexample to us children of God. But the sad fact is that we sometimes find ourselves admiring people like this, and God forgive us, we sometimes find that we are people like this. I am anyway. Um, and th that, that's, a, that's a sorry state of affairs. And as we realize, listening to Habakkuk and the rest of the prophetic witness in the Bible, the words of Christ, we've got to realize that we're on the edge of being accurately described this way rather than the other way. And that should scare us back to God as many times as we, as we see that in ourselves. All right, so verse 5 then goes on. And verse 5 reads, Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all people. The Hebrew in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5, is very difficult. Um, people struggle to translate it these days into modern languages, into English. It begins with the word moreover, which almost certainly connects it 
to the same puffed up soul that's being referred to in chapter 4. So he, he's going on to talk further about the man whose soul is puffed up and not upright within him. The, the opposite, as it were, to the, to the righteous who live by faith or who live by faithfulness to God. And here it sort of fleshed out our, our vision of this person. It, it says that, that he's, he's immoderate and he's excessive and he's reckless and he's uncontrollable and he's insatiable, right? Arrogant, never at rest. It says his greed is as wide as Sheol. Sheol is the place in, in, in the Hebrew way of thinking where souls go when they die and all men go there. So if your greed is as big as Sheol, it means it's total. You, you're, you want to eat up everyone in the world the same way death eats up everyone in the world is, is, the, is, the, is the point. He never has enough. Right. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Sort of like, I, I sort of put up a picture of Donald Trump or something. I don't like to put up real, real pictures. But you can think of examples of, of people whose, the, their religion basically is total war on the world. They want to win, it's winner take all. They want to win everything for themselves, right? They want it all. And when I thought about this a little bit, the, the guy who popped into my mind was Alexander the Great. And this, according to Google, this is a picture of Alexander the Great in, in conquest. And the reason I thought of him is Alexander the Great it's said that after he conquered the known world, he wept because there were no worlds left to conquer. Another story said he, he wept because he heard that there might be some other nation someplace, but he didn't know what they were, so he couldn't go there and conquer them. To which somebody replied, well, it's good he didn't conquer them because his father had told him there were other worlds to conquer, you know, in the, in the galaxy or someplace, and he would have wept some more. His character was to be a total victor over everything, right? He wasn't faithful to God. He wasn't a faithful person. He may have had some admirable traits from a, a worldly point of view, but his, his, his modus operandi was totally, you know, to, to take, over, take over the world. Like Gordon Gekko on, on, on Wall Street. Right? And the English Standard Version, following about half of the manuscripts that there are, is somehow associating this person with wine. Here in my ESV, says here, moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. About half of the manuscripts, rather than wine, read here in the Hebrew money or wealth. And it's not known which is the right, which is the right translation. Okay. But in either case, I really, I really don't think that the, this difficult bit of Hebrew matters because the point is that this arrogant, faithless man He's not corrupted by wine. He's not arrogant because he's drunk. He's not corrupted by money. He is, like wine and money, the one who corrupts the entire world. Okay, he, he's, 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 he's out of, it's, it's a force unto itself, his money, is wine. Once people start drinking it, once people have it, Jesus says money is the root of all evil. Now these, these are things that go out into the world and, and corrupt the world and throw the world down and, do, and, and help people who would control the world to control the world because they weaken the godly among us. So I think almost certainly Habakkuk, as he says these words, he has in his mind the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians. That's what's at the front of his mind because that's the life he lives. That's the place where he lives. But I think... This faithless figure, whether it's Gordon Gekko from the movie Wall Street or whether it's Alexander the Great or other figures that we can think of, these are sort of types of Satan or sort of types of Antichrist. These are the opposite of Jesus. Think of what Christ is as the perfect man whom we're all supposed to follow and emulate. This is the opposite of that. This is what you don't want to be. And, and if you find yourself being this way, you know, be afraid. Be very afraid because it's not what God approves. And God is saying, just wait a little bit. All these guys are history. God's coming after, after all of them. It's just a matter of waiting for the appointed time for their destruction. This is, this is the, the call against the people of Israel. And it is primal for So you're saying that in, in, in the depth of, of humanity, nations, the morals of the nation disappears, 
and all that stuff is, is, is this consumption. And, and therefore, it's got to go. It eventually brings to its own room. Well, I, well, I concede that in, in parts of this prophecy, Habakkuk may be still speaking against the people in Israel. He is also, and perhaps primarily, speaking against the Babylonians who are, who are, who are going to be thrown down. Oh. And while I do th also think that there's a progression in history, I mean, history is a straight line, not a circle. We're moving towards the coming of Christ and his kingdom on earth. From the time of the fall of Adam until now, and until Christ comes again, we see pretty much the same pattern of wickedness, right? I mean, what's the difference between Nebuchadnezzar or Saddam Hussein? Or you know, I don't want to start naming real people, but I mean, there's, there's plenty of evil in the world that will represent the, the dark side of this prophecy. People, innocent people, will look at that and say to God, why, God, do you allow this evil to happen? human trafficking, you know, all the evil things I could think of to say. The Christian heart might say, why God, why God, why God? And the answer would be the same as what God is giving to Habakkuk. He's saying, I know, but wait, wait. There's a time appointed when everything comes good, and it's, it's not always as soon as you might like it to be, but God, God knows when it is. And so I, I think that Nebuchadnezzar is one tiny example of a general truth that the prophet's speaking to here. And if you think about it, this is a very small piece of human history. We're talking about you know, a part of a century you know, that when Habakkuk would have seen the world around him and be prophesying with that in his mind. But the truth that he is giving us is an eternal truth coming from God, which would be applicable now as well as it was then, I, I think. So wherever there's evil, it's just a question of time until God puts it away. It is probably the point. <laughs> so he's going to, the, 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 the prophecy goes forward, and, and I don't know whether this is the, the vision, part of, I mean, if we're hearing part of the vision that Habakkuk is supposed to write down, or whether that comes in the appearance of God, the theophany in chapter 3, where God sort of appears to him, or what? I think it, we can't really know for sure the content of the prophecy that God told Habakkuk to write down and put on the road sign, but it, it's, in, it's in this document someplace that, that, that we're reading. <clears throat> okay, and, and the, next, the next thing in verses 6 through 7 that's said is, Shall not all these, remember he's just said he gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all people, verse 5. And then we continue in verse 6 and, it, and he says, Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own for how long and loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble then you will be spoiled for them. Okay, so now <clears throat> maybe we're starting to see this vision that Habakkuk's in instructed to write down when these evil figures receive their, their come, up, come up and says, as, as we say in, in English, the arrogant man or nation who's abused everybody now, we read in verses 6 and 7, will finally and inevitably become the victim of the very ones that he's victimized. Right. And I have a real-world example up on this slide. This is a picture of the bread riots in France in the 18th century, which led to, among other factors perhaps, led to the French Revolution, which caused the French monarchy to be thrown down. So the French kings and queens ignored the people, and they, they impoverished the people, and they victimized the people, and they were proud, and they were greedy. They were sort of uh, 18th century France version of Nebuchadnezzar. And what happened was eventually the very people whom they had victimized brought them to trial and cut off their heads and took over the country, right? It didn't, the French monarchy didn't survive the anger and the, and the, the retribution of those who had been their, been their victims. And something similar I think is foreseen for Babylon and Habakkuk's day. He's saying, look, Nebuchadnezzar, when you're finally taking everything from your debtors, 
and they have basically nothing left to lose, the last thing they're going to do is they're going to come get you. Right? And it happens all over the world in all times and places. Right? You, imagine a, a lender, somebody wants to borrow money from you, and you say, okay, give me your land as, as collateral. Give me the deed to your farm. I'll loan you money. And then they, they run out of money and they come back again and you say, give me the deed to your tractor, to your house, to your, you know, and, and finally everything that the guy owns is owned by the guy who loaned him the money. Now the, the guy who's been borrowing the money has nothing and he has nothing to lose. He's just about one little push away from going to burn that guy's house down, right? So if, if you live in a world where you, you consume everything and you victimize everybody because you want to win and, and you're so arrogant, Eventually, the people who you overthrow will overthrow you, is, is what I think Habakkuk is saying <laughs> about these evil figures closest to him being Nebuchadnezzar, but others too in history. And the thought continues then in verse 8 on a slightly different dimension. <coughs> Slide 8 says, because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. So just as the poor rise up to overthrow the rich oppressors in whatever context, nations finally rise up to overthrow nations that have been overweening and overly aggressive. And the best example I could think of was Nazi Germany, who came really close to eating up the whole world. Right? And yet even they couldn't survive what they did. Finally their ambition wasn't sustainable. The, the nations rose up and banded together and, and put them down and, and, and punished them. All right. And this fact that we're talking about, the fact that there's never been a permanent evil empire Every evil empire is thrown down without exception to this day from the creation of the world is a very interesting fact. It says something about God and how he's governing the universe. Evil has its day in many forms and in many places and in many times, but it, it doesn't survive. And even people who don't know Yahweh, even people who aren't Jews and aren't Christians, understand this. Some people call it poetic justice. Right? The, the Greek plays of Sophocles, it was called hubris, the, the pride that leads to your downfall, right? Karma is another expression people use who aren't Christian, right? What goes around comes around, you know? If you're evil, evil will come back to you, and, and all of this. This is obviously true about the universe that we live in. You don't have to be Christian to see it. You don't have to be Jewish to see it. It is also wisdom coming from our God, who says in many places, in, in Proverbs, for example, Pride goeth before the fall, and, and so forth and so on. But this is a kind of truth of humanity, right? Nobody can be totally evil without finally ha coming down. Somebody's going to bring them down if they're going to be that way. <clears throat> and I think that's the part of the message that, that keeps going out from Habakkuk, I mean, to Habakkuk from, from God, is, is, is telling him, it's just wait, just wait. Evil always, always falls. Right. <clears throat> I apologize to everyone because this, for the first time in my life I'm using a picture of a real world example but I just couldn't think of another example better than this okay. <clears throat> I'm probably going to have somebody blow up my house tonight but I, 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 it just came to my mind when I read this verses 9 through 13 woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house. By cutting off many peoples, you have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the wood, woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds his city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. All right, so it is the sinful natural inclination, I believe, of every human, every human being to protect their family, to enrich themselves at the expense of other people. That is our fallen state. Everyone will kind of do the same evil stuff given the opportunity. Now, some people have, are put in a position where in the process 
they can really go to town. They can kill other people and impoverish other people and debase, debase other people and kidnap other people and do all kinds of really wicked stuff to, to, to think to make themselves safe and happy at the expense of other people. And we all do that. <clears throat> I, I would say we all do that to some extent, right? We're, that, that's, that's the sinful nature of man. We, we'll all <clears throat> sometimes buy our own happiness at the expense of the sadness and misery of other, other people. But for people who really have an opportunity to, to kill and, and to debase and to make, they need to be really afraid, right? Because God is, is really, really against this. It says here, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people's labor merely for fire. Most people think what that means is you work hard and you work hard and you work hard and you get nothing. It's just all burned up. You, you work your life so hard. It, you, you work so hard and you're so hungry and you try to do something, but actually your whole life is nothing because it just is nothing because you've been, you've been oppressed. That's not God's will. And it's not God's will that nations will weary themselves for nothing. Where that's happening, it's happening because God forbids. God is sitting there hating it as much as you are, more. But the appointed time hasn't come to deal with it yet, and it will. And when it does, the people who I've just described are in desperate, desperate trouble. Okay, so we might ask, why, Lord, or how long, O oh Lord? But the answer is always, wait for it. It's surely going to come. And before, remember, in chapter 1, God said, I am raising up the Babylonians. Really, the way I like to think about that is this way. Yeah, he's raising up the Babylonians. He's doing it to throw down the Assyrians and also to chastise Israel, which Habakkuk also understood. And he's doing it just until the time appointed to destroy Babylon. It's, he's not sanctioning the evil in Babylon, right? It's, it's, it's under his control. But the time to put it away just isn't as soon as we might like if we're a victim of Babylon. Okay. So then in verse 14, kind of a side comment, God says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. To, to me, this is a really powerful image in, in, in several ways. Clearly, the overarching point is that all the bad things that we can find in the world can only exist provisionally. In fact, in God's mind, they don't exist. They've already been put away. But in the human time that we live in, we live through periods of time where we actually have to coexist at the period of history where that evil is still operating, right? And so, but one day, God says, the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the water covers, this, covers the sea, right? So if you look out at the ocean and see nothing but water, that's going to be the glory of God. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to cover everything. There's not going to be any place where it's not. And I would add to the poetry, it'll be so deep you won't be able to see down to the bottom of it, right? And, and nothing can stand against it. That's what it's going to be like. An interesting tension to me is the, the story of Noah and the flood because, you know, there was a time when God covered the earth with water because he looked out at the world and there was nothing but wickedness everywhere. If it hadn't been for his plan to save a people for himself through Noah, the world would have been that way, really. The world would have been covered with water and all the evil would have been God, gone and God could have started over someplace and done something else, but that's not what he decided to do. But he's going to work through this very difficult history that Habakkuk's bothered by. And when he gets to the end of it, you won't be able to find a drop of evil anywhere because God's glory is going to cover everything. And the picture that I have up here, part of the reason this is a powerful image to me, how many of you guys will read The Lord of the Rings? Anybody? So the, in, in the book, The Lord of the Rings, there's a place where the evil wizard, Saruman, is up on top of a, a tower and place called Isengard, if I pronounce it correctly. And he's got all kinds of evil stuff under the ground and they're breeding wickedness and all, the, all kind of evil goes out from there. And so the tree people divert the rivers and they pour water down into the, into the basement of his place. And they keep pouring it in and pouring it in and pouring it in until nothing comes out but clean water. All the smoke is gone. 
it just the purity of the water washed that place away. It was completely canceled by the water that, you know, the, this is a fictional story, but by the water that, that was poured in. And that's the picture that came to my mind. That's what God will do. So there's evil in all these holes and rocks and crannies. There's evil beings everywhere. But none of it's getting away from God because he's just going to pour in the water, the glory of his righteousness until nothing comes out but good. And when you can't see any more dark water or smoke or any evil thing, God will be finished and then Habakkuk won't have anything to complain about anymore. And all the people who live by faith will be happy with God forever. So I hope that I don't get in trouble for stealing this picture from my Bible study because I, I don't use it with permission of whoever made a Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> okay, and then he goes on speaking against the ungodly here in, in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 2. He says, huh? oh, sorry, I'm in chapter 3. Verses 15 and 16 of chapter 2. It says, Woe to him who makes his neighbors drunk. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. So, so far God has spoken against arrogant, greedy people. He's spoken against international violence. He's spoken against oppressive, self-serving regimes that build up their family at the expense of the nation. Now he has an eye to people who seduce other people into doing evil things that debase and destroy them. I think this could be personal seduction, like giving, you know, giving alcohol to an alcoholic, giving drugs to a drug addict. It could be state-sponsored terrorism. It could be wicked alliances between nations that conspire to do something bad together. It could be radical extremist groups that conspire to do evil in the world. The point is, everybody that conspires to lure other people into doing wickedness is on the list of people who will be utterly put away when God pours out his glory into the world. God's justice is coming against all, all wickedness. <clears throat> and not to be excluded are people who are wicked to the environment, I think, if I read correctly, verse 17. Here God says, the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them for the blood of men and the violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Okay. I think here the prophet is seeing the, the deforestation of the cedars of Lebanon. You know, people, Lebanon was filled with trees throughout the Bible. That was their great wealth. And here he sees violence being done to the forests in Lebanon. He talks about beasts that were terrorized and killed. He talks also about the blood of men, the destruction of cities. And I think God is utterly opposed to all of that. Um, I wouldn't put up a picture of animal cruelty. I couldn't stand it. But there's a picture of tree cruelty up there and another picture just representing the animals. Every kind of wickedness God is going to put away, including the wickedness that destroys nature and animals. I believe. And then verses 18 and 19 <coughs> say, What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in its own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. All right, and so I remarked last week and have several times before that it seems to me when we listen to the voice of the prophets, oftentimes they're a great deal more worked up. God is a great deal more worked up about the violence we do to each other and to his creation than he is against idolatry. God can take care of himself. I mean, idolatry is bad for us, as, as is described here. It's a, it's a worthless activity because idols are utterly worthless and they can't save anybody from anything. But he doesn't touch on this point until the end after having dwelt on you know, how people are cruel to one another. 
He does end, however, in verses 18 and 19 by saying, among all the other wicked things that are going to be washed away when God's glory covers the earth is all of these worthless idols. They have no value, they have no purpose, they can't save the nations, they can't save the men who oppose God. And when the justice comes, surely nobody should attribute the justice to any of these false gods. There are no false gods. There's only one God, and He's the one that's working in salvation for people and finally delivering justice for all in the end. There's only one God, and that's the, the point near, near the end here. Did anybody see my Babylonian idol? <laughs> That's the same logo as American Idol, right? No. <laughs> all right, and so finally then, and it's, it's, a, it's a fitting conclusion to all of this, is, is, is it says that the Lord is in his holy temple let all the earth keep silence before him all right and so yeah habakkuk has has asked the question that all serious children of god need to ask themselves and, and do ask themselves if they're paying attention is why is there so much evil in the world And it's a difficult thing sometimes to, 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 to contend with, particularly if the evil comes very close to home. You know, if, if your child dies in an automobile accident, if you are diagnosed with cancer, if a tsunami, you know, wipes out part of your country, um, many, many difficult things happen that would cause people to say to God, why, how long? And I, one of the reasons why I think you can believe the Bible is because the Bible doesn't by any means shy away from the fact that this is a question human beings have to ask. It looks honestly at that. God's people do. Job did. David did. The prophets do. Even the fact, certainly extent, Jesus did. And God's answer has to always be the same. Trust me. Wait for it. There's an appointed time for everything. Persevere, as Jesus said to the churches in Revelation. We can't always understand, actually. We can't work it out in detail in our mind. It wouldn't be possible for us. But we can at least know that other Christians, like Habakkuk, I'm, he's a Christian almost in the Old Testament, since other children of God have asked the question and have had the same answer that we do, which is, wait, there's an appointed time. Question? I will mention, in case any of you were thinking this and, and uh, wondered why I didn't say anything, um, in chapter 2, verse 4, the second half says, but the righteous shall live by his faith. In uh, probably another translation anyway is by faithfulness. This passage is quoted importantly by the Apostle Paul in Galatians and in Revelations. It's quoted by the author of the letter to the Hebrews. It was an important passage in the New Testament where it's drawn into the discussion of justification by grace through faith. The reason why I didn't go off on that, that point tonight is because I couldn't have done justice to that point as well as to the, to the rest of the chapter. But also I think it's better first to understand what Habakkuk was saying before we next think about what Paul and the author of the letter of the Hebrews were thinking when they quoted it. And I think next week I may start by looking at how the New Testament has handled that passage in particular and maybe have a quick generally because it's rather interesting and I think to anticipate the conclusion I, th I think that I find 
that the spirit of Habakkuk within the Old Testament context and the spirit of the gospel within the New Testament context are perfectly harmonious. I think it's a very insightful quote by Paul that he would reach back here for this verse and use it in Romans and in Galatians the way he used it and I think it's entirely appropriate. Not that Paul needs my permission but um, I, I didn't mean to make it sound like that but I mean I can see why Paul is drawn to this verse as he makes his presentation of the gospel in, in the New Testament. So maybe we'll start there last time. Yeah, next time. You mentioned that the question asked by Habakkuk is mentioned by many people throughout the Bible. Uh, I'm kind of struck by it, kind of contrast with like, God's lengthy answer to his question here and kind of the, the, the non answer that Job received. Well, um, yeah, I, and there's nothing that says that, that each book in the Bible needs to treat the same subject in the same way. And to, to which I would add, I don't think that Job and the Minor Prophets are the same literary genre even. Job is something different. It's one of the oldest texts that we have in the Bible. And what it's doing is, is not prophecy in the sense that I think these guys are doing, doing prophecy. And so I think we would almost have to treat it as a separate kind of writing and, and take it on its own, on its own terms. Um, I mean, it's almost the only place in the whole Old Testament that Satan shows up, for example. Um, it's, it's a very different kind of piece of writing for, for the Old Testament. So I, yeah, Job does get a kind of a who, who are you to ask me this question kind of response. But <coughs> so does Habakkuk, sort of, right? God doesn't get out his day planner and say, well, let me tell you when the appointed day is, right? And he doesn't know that. And he, he doesn't say, let me tell you before it's time about my son Jesus, who will become a man and come down and do the work that Jesus will do. That's still not revealed to him. Um, if it had been, people would have, un, would have received Jesus differently than they did when we read about in the New Testament, right? I mean, they, they didn't expect Jesus to be like he was when he came. Um, Well, as usual, I have to start out by saying, I, I don't know. I had the same question. <clears throat> um, I can only tell you what I think, but I, I'm not, this is just my personal way of thinking. Um, I think what we can see, first of all, is that in the last verse, God is being contrasted with the idols that are spoken of in the two preceding verses. So, it, he's talked about worthless idols, which are just blocks of wood and pieces of metal and useless, meaningless, nothing kinds of kind of things. And God cannot be set beside them and compared to them. We can't say, well, God is better than the idols. No. Idols are, are nothing. <laughs> and God is greater than everything, right? It's, you can't compare idols to God. And so I think part of what the meaning is is just to make sure we get the point that God is nothing like false gods. You can't put him on your shelf or talk to him or <laughs> pray to say lots of words. And say, because he's real. He's really God. And when it says God is in his holy temple, 
I put up a picture of this picture rather than, for example, a picture of the temple in Jerusalem or something because I think the temple in Jerusalem was ever only a symbol of, of heaven. So the, the real God, Yahweh, can't be contained in any building. He, he can't even be contained in our universe, right? So he's, he's utterly above everything. And so, so I, th I think that, that that's the main point. And when it says we should be silent, I think it probably just means respectful, reverent, awesome, yeah. So, it's, it's sort of not the answer that Job got, right? I, mean, I, I don't think. If, it, you could read it that way. You could read the last verses. God is saying this. Who are you to, to ask me when I'm going to wipe out the devil? <laughs> that one. It doesn't seem to be that kind of note sounded here. And, and partly, and maybe that will be even more clear when we read the, the song that finishes in chapter 3. I mean, there's... Well, I, I, no, but I, when you started, when you started, what I thought you were going to say was, is that, is that I, the idols are silent because they're just blocks of wood. <laughs> so, but, but, but God is silent because He's the sovereign Lord of all creation, and He and He can speak when He wants to and as He wants to and, and do what He wants to. So, so He may be, for example, silent when we ask Him, when will you overthrow the Babylonians or, or something. But it's not, it's not because he can't overthrow the Babylonians, it's just because he doesn't want to tell you. So the, islands, the idols have to be silent, but you know, we should be mindful that, or maybe that's what you were going to say, we should be, I don't, I don't think there's any connection with that. But I, I don't think God is saying to Habakkuk, there's no evidence that God is upset that Habakkuk asked the question, right? He's having a conversation with him, actually. Yeah. Well, I think that this established presence of the Lord says he controls all nations, they rise and fall. Uh, he speaks with sovereignty that no, no leader can get there unless he appointed them. And so I think it was just to reiterate that, you know, have faith in me. He, he probably knew this, but he just needed assurance of like God talking to him to to really believe this. He says, so now I can stand at the you know at, at the wall and be at the tower because I know this is so. He's just he's in a lonely place and at, at the end of, of Israel's time on on earth at that time. And so he he, he needed something, I'm sure. And that that would establish a confirmation that he Totally control all the nations and what they're doing on his behest. Yeah, and the people probably needed it too. So I, yeah. <clears throat> um, oh, sorry. Since you're sitting in the seat of power behind the <laughs> controls, I. I was going to say when I see this verse, I think um, the other verses are just that Yahweh speaks with sovereignty. Yeah. Like the other verses are just trusting. Yeah. <clears throat> which which advice is sometimes easier or harder to take, right? I mean, from our own real life perspective, we probably all can't hold that thought consistently always, but it's true. <clears throat>
Okay. So I, I'll pray and we can go. Thank you, God, for um, bringing uh, such a nice group of people together tonight to study the Bible. And uh, I hope that the words that we've read have been understood correctly by us. If any parts we've misunderstood, please help us to easily and quickly forget what's incorrect, but <clears throat> to easily and permanently remember the things that are truly spoken to us and that you wanted us to hear. Please uh, make us uh, uh, more faithful, um, more patient, uh, to wait on you knowing that you know exactly what you're doing and you have appointed a time for everything and that as believers in Christ we have nothing to fear um, and only uh, wonderful things to look forward to if only we will just uh, live by faith, be faithful in you. Please give us, each of us and all of us, the gift of faith, more than we had when we came here tonight. Please uh, bless everybody, help everybody get home safely. Please bless this church and pastors and ministry leaders and other people who do uh, work and worship here. And we ask the same thing for all churches everywhere who assemble in the name of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.